everybody, it's Keith Kelly here. We're going to look at the book of Leviticus today. And it's a very interesting and exciting book. And the talk is really called Life Lessons from Leviticus. But I want to tell you a story. I heard a man speak, oh, 55 years ago. And he was an old man when he spoke. He must have been in his 80s. And he'd been in the First World War. And in 1918, in France, he took part in one of the last cavalry charges in history. And he was shot off his horse and he was bleeding profusely. And he really thought he was going to die. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought you were going to die? I've been in that situation a few times. But he cried out to God and he said, Oh God, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. And he felt that as he prayed, God did something in his heart. And I was listening to him. Oh, 40, 50 years after this had happened. And he was really following the Lord Jesus. He'd actually been part of a great revival in some islands called the Hebride Islands off the north of Scotland in the United Kingdom. And he'd been one of the instruments God had used to pour out his spirit and so many people got touched and got saved. And I just want to show you a little um, picture of what it might have looked like on the battlefield. This is a painting of some of the things that were going on. Terrible, terrible business war. And it's interesting, the Bible says, Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord, Hebrews 12, verse 14. And Duncan Campbell called out to God because he thought, this could be my last breath. His blood was pouring out and he was dying. He was rescued. A, another s trooper or soldier came along on a horse and carried him to the first aid station. And he recovered. But he always loved that scripture. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses me from all sin. And that is the message of the book of Leviticus. That without the shedding of blood, there's no cleansing from sin. And the whole book of Leviticus is pointing forward with one great message to the Lord Jesus Christ that is going to come and his blood is going to be shed for us that we can be as holy as a saved sinner can be. Now we've looked at Genesis and it shows us human people ruined by sin. Then we looked at Exodus and we saw how the people were set free from slavery and Another picture of Christ, like Moses, taking the people from slavery to salvation, from sin and Satan to the promised land. And now we come to Leviticus, which shows how the redeemed, those who've been bought with blood, can have ac access to the fellowship and communion with God. In fact, the word holy occurs 150 times in the book of Leviticus. When I first read the book of Leviticus, it didn't make an awful lot of sense to me. One of the things about the Bible is to keep reading it. And I realized how it it was so predating modern science. They were so clean about washing before they ate, washing if they touched anything that was dead. And Really, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, scientific textbook, you could say. It's about how to 
um, be hygienic, how to be clean. When I read it, I was a young man at the time. I wasn't all that hygienic, I don't think. But it made me think, I'm going to be as clean as possible. <laughs> how wonderful. And not just outwardly, but inwardly. Now, there's five great offerings mentioned in the book of Leviticus. And each one points to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a tremendous, exciting Bible study for you to follow through. I hope you will. And the first one is where they offered a lamb. And Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And taking all these five offerings together, you get a perfect picture of the work of the on the cross of Calvary. It's like having all these mirrors and you look at these mirrors and it shows the cross from different aspects. It's absolutely wonderful, the Bible, tremendous. So here we have five offerings and uh, we've got the burnt offering and then we've got the sin offering, the meal offering, peace offering and trespass offering. Let me just very briefly say what these offerings are. The burnt offering went up to God as a sweet smell. It pictures Christ who gave himself as a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. They would sacrifice the animal and they were saying that this animal is dying instead of me. His blood was being shed, poured out instead of me. So Jesus died on the cross instead of you and me. So we can enter in to the glorious salvation. He offered himself up entirely to God to do his will, even unto death. I want to challenge you. Will you offer yourself up to God today entirely and say, Lord, I want to do your will, whatever you want. Christ bears our sins and does accomplishes the Father's will. What a challenge for us today. The other morning, I found great joy just coming before God and saying, I offer myself to you. In fact, I do it quite often. I love the scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, it says living sacrifice. He wants us to give ourselves to him while we're alive as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's what true worship is, to offer yourself up to God. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed, be changed, transfigured <laughs> by the renewal of your mind that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And as you present yourself to God like that, he'll change you. Oh, I, I find such joy in coming before the Lord, and it, it thrills my heart. I, I only wished I can impart it to you in some way. But you sh give yourself up to God, and he will transform you. In fact, the Greek word is metamorpho. It's a word we use in uh, science, metamorphosis. It's changing from one thing to another. For example, a tadpole turns into a frog or a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. Even in uh, geology, they say a lump of coal can ultimately become a diamond. And uh, you can think as you wait upon God in surrender, You'll be transformed and you'll rise up with wings like eagles. You'll change. God is in the business of change. There was a missionary in India called Amy Carmichael. One day she took some children to see a goldsmith, you know, refining the gold to make it as pure as possible, get rid of all impurities. And she said to the person who was doing it, how do you know 
when the gold is pure. And he said, when I can see my face in it, something so pure, polished, you can see your face in it. And you know what God wants to do? He wants to refine your life so Jesus can see his face in you. Don't you think that's wonderful? Can Jesus be seen in me? Can people see Jesus in you and me, in us? The meal offering was the second one. This shows Christ as a perfect and sinless man, his spotless life offered as a sweet smell to God. In this offering, there was no shedding of blood. It speaks more of his perfect life rather than his death. The fine flower pictures his sinless humanity, his moral qualities. The oil pictures the grace and power of the spirit in his life. The frankincense shows the sweetness and fragrance of his person and life. Did you know there were so many wonderful things in the Bible? I want you to get thirsty to read the Bible and to get hungry to feed on the word of God. Then there was the peace offering. Sweet savour to God, sweet smell to God, sweet taste to God. The blood and the fat and kidneys of the offering burned upon the altar as the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. And um, the, the priest partook of it as well. Um, they, they were able to eat it and it was like communion and fellowship, communing, communing one with another and with God. And through the cross, we are enjoy fellowship with God and fellowship with every believer. We are at peace with God through the work of the cross. We can feed upon Christ in fellowship. Oh, fellowship with the Father. How wonderful. Then there's a sin offering. This was a non-sweet savor offering. The special feature of this offering, the whole bull being burnt upon the ground outside of the camp of Israel after the blood and fat were put on the altar. And this was for sin. And it shows you the scripture in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Christ was made sin for us. This is one of the great mysteries of the Bible. We can't understand how he became sin for us, but we know that he took all our sin, all our guilt, all our sickness, all our everything that was against you, against me. He took it on himself. He exchanged his life. He gave us his life and he took our old life, <laughs> our old filthy clothes. He took off and gave us a new pure clothing. Christ forsaken by God as our sin bearer. The bullock or the bull was burnt outside the camp, picturing Christ who went outside the city and was crucified. And then the last offering was the trespass offering. Sin is a trespass against God, breaking God's laws. And restitution is made for the wrong done with the and they added a fifth part to the offering to show they were trying to make restitution. It's always important to restore and make restitution. Put things right if you can, if it's possible. He answered God for our sins and paid our debts by his shed blood. And this is the way the sinner comes to Christ. There was a Bible teacher called C.W. Slemming, and he gave a fascinating outline of the offerings in his tremendous book called The Bible Digest. He said these things. The burnt offering, it pictures consecration of self. Just as Christ gave himself as a burnt offering on the cross, we must give ourselves to God unreservedly. The meal offering, the consecration of our gifts, Christ the corn of wheat, the bread of life bruised and crushed on Calvary. He gave his life to be the bread for the world and we are to give our lives to be like broken bread and poured out wine to feed the hungry, to meet people's needs. The sin offering, Christ is our sin offering. Through his death, he sets us free <laughs> from guilt. 
and condemnation. Wow, that's wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful. The trespass offering, this involves restitution and restoration, putting everything right in your life, and then you'll find real liberty. And then number five, peace offering. Christ is our peace offering, brings us into peace with God. Oh, how wonderful to have peace with God, peace with other people, peace with yourself, to able to live with yourself. Oh, not hating yourself anymore, but accepting yourself as a new creature. The other important type or picture in Leviticus, I'll just look at very briefly, are the feasts of Israel. When you study the feasts of Israel, four great things jump out from the word of God. You hunger for God's holiness. You fear God and respect him more greatly. You want to reach out and bless your neighbor more fully. The reality is Christ, you love Jesus more deeply through studying these things. Here's a little chart which you can just have a look at, and this will help you see what each one stands for. And here we are. First of all was the Passover. This took place at the time of the crucifixion. The Jews were saved by the blood of the Lamb in Egypt. The blood was put on the doorposts and the angel of death passed over them. If we put our trust in the Lord Jesus, judgment will pass over us. Then there was a feast of unleavened bread. They didn't put any yeast, anything to make the bread rise. Jews were to eat pure unleavened bread for one week. And it shows us that Christ has paid our sins. We are now clear of sin. No additives, nothing in us which can cause corruption through the pure blood of Jesus. Then there was the first fruits. It was like the spring harvest and they sacrificed in the temple and it shows, points to Christ who was rose from the dead after the crucifixion. He was the first fruit. You know, one day you're going to rise if you follow and love the Lord Jesus. I'm going to rise. We'll come out of the grave. He is the first of the fruit. We are the rest of the fruit. Isn't that great? Then Pentecost, that's the great um, feast of harvest time. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were saved and filled with the Spirit. Began when many crops were available and the people celebrated God's provision. How wonderful. And that was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Trumpets, the feast of trumpets would sound and all the workers would go to the temple and one day the trumpet will sound and all the believers will be caught up to be with the Lord in heaven. We call it the rapture. Isn't that wonderful? These feasts are fantastic, really are fantastic. Oh, that you should study them for yourself and really see what God is trying to say to us. The day of atonement, that was to cleanse us from all sin. God's justice was perfectly satisfied. On the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, and then there was the Feast of Tabernacles. I once was invited to go along to a Feast of Tabernacles in a Jewish synagogue in, in uh, the city of Leeds in England. And the people were so welcoming, so kind to us, and they let us uh, take part in their service with them. I don't think they realized, but it's celebration, celebrating the one that we can be one with God. We can dwell with him. And of course, the great tabernacle of God is at the end of the Bible in Revelation, where the tabernacle, the new Jerusalem comes down from God. We will be one with God and with one another forever and ever. The Bible is a miracle overseen by the Holy Spirit. God can change any life. God can change your life. I read about a young man in Mexico called David Sol, and he was a wicked man. He was a sinful man. He got into all kinds of trouble. 
one day he got hold of a Bible and he just started to read the Bible. No, he didn't have anybody to guide him, didn't have any help. He just read it. And as a result, he came to Christ. <clears throat> he went on to pastor a church in his own town, <clears throat> Villa Flores. 23 preachers have come out of there so far. The amazing power of God's infallible, God-breathed, Holy Spirit, supervised, inspired word of God. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16, every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration. As if God went, <sighs> and there's power in the word of God, and the Holy Spirit lights up the word of God to our hearts. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration, profitable for instruction, for reproof, conviction of sin, for correction of, and for training in righteousness, in thought, purpose, and, and action. You know, you can experience these things for yourself. Give yourself to reading the word of God. Give yourself to studying the word of God. Give yourself to pray and speak to the Lord God. And all these great lessons will become real in your heart. It's such a joy to dwell upon these things. I, I love it. One of the things in Leviticus is the great tabernacle. You could spend, oh, weeks studying the tabernacle, but it shows us how we can come to God through the one great sacrifice. There was a, a, an altar here. And that symbolizes the cross where the, the blood was shed. An animal died, so the offerer didn't have to die. Then they came to a, like a big bathtub where they could wash away all the dirt and blood and put on new clothes. The new priest would put on new clothes, enter into the holy place. They could partake of the bread, the, the unleavened bread. And that was wonderful. Because that symbolized fellowship with one another and with God. There was a great lampstand where the oil would flow and give light. And that is the revelation and understanding the Holy Spirit gives to us. Then there was a, an altar of incense and that symbolizes prayer. When we come through to God, we enter into a prayer life with our Father in heaven. You can go into the holy place. And there was the Ark of the Covenant. It was um, cedar wood covered in gold. And that pictures the, the nature of Christ. He's human, yet divine. And inside that Ark, there was a, a rod, Aaron's rod, which came back to life and budded. And that pictures the resurrection of Christ. And then there were the Ten Commandments. And these, the laws... As that's think of that as the heart. It was the law written in the heart. The new covenant, God puts the law in your heart so you don't just have to do what God says. You so want to do what God says because you love him. You want to please your father. And then there was a pot of manna, the bread from heaven where God will feed you and satisfy you. And then there's a great throne, mercy seat where God sat and forgave the people the priest, high priest, would go in once a year on the Day of Atonement and he'd offer for the people and everybody would worry, is the priest going to come out because it, he was going to go into the presence of God? Would he die there? But no, when he came out, he we think he went to the entrance to the tabernacle and he would say, the offering is accepted. Your sins are forgiven. I could imagine the people all cheering and Amen. It's done. So God bless you. I'm sorry to go through it so quickly, but how wonderful these things are. Please go and study them for yourself. Go and read them and God will teach you and bless you. May the Lord bless you until we meet again.